We are joined today by Professors Arthur Middleton, Indy Burke, and Jennifer Robb for a discussion about art, ecology, science, wilderness, and myth in the American West. This conversation is pre presented in conjunction with the exhibition Matthew Barney Redoubt. The show includes four monumental sculptures and over 40, 40 engravings and electrocoppered plates, which are on view in the fourth floor, fourth floor mezzanine, and American Painting and Sculpture Galleries. The show also includes a feature-length film, which screens here in this lecture hall every Saturday at 1.30. The film traces the story of a wolf hunt in Idaho's Sawtooth Mountain Range, while playing out Ovid's myth of D Diana and Acteon, weaving the theme of the hunt with those of mythology, cosmology, history, ballistics, and artistic creation. The rugged Idaho landscape is setting and subject and the film asks us to consider our place and movements in the natural world. Arthur Middleton is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's also a fellow of the National Geographic Society. Professor Middleton's research focuses on wolves and the reintroduction of wolves in the American West, one of the underlying themes in Barney's work. Indy Burke is the Carl W. Knobloch, Jr. Dean at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a professor of ecosystem ecology. Her own research has focused on carbon and nitrogen cycling and the effects of land management on these systems, and she places a strong emphasis on, inter on interdisciplinary scholarship. Jennifer Robb is an associate professor in the history of art, an affiliated faculty member in the program in the history of science and medicine, and she serves on the steering committee of the new Yale Environmental Humanities Initiative. She has written on everything from the paintings of Frederick Church to post-Civil War photography, and you may have read her essay in the catalog for a doubt. On a personal note, I had the pleasure of taking Professor Rob's class on monuments this past fall, and I've been thinking back to that class quite a bit when spending time with Redoubt, particularly when considering the relationship between art and environment and how art not only reflects but actively shapes our understanding of history and our place in a landscape, themes that I hope this conversation will touch on today. Professor Middleton will begin today's program with a short presentation on wolves and myth, and from there, our three professors will take the stage and we will move into the discussion, which will consider questions about confronting myth in the fields of art and science, the material impacts of myth, and the relationship between myth and knowledge. Uh, the conversation will open to audience questions at the end, and following the program, we invite you to spend time in the exhibition as the museum is open till eight o'clock, um, and we ask that you please come back to spend, uh, spend time watching the film Redoubt, which will play on Saturday at 1.30. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here, and I'll now invite Professor Middleton to the podium. Let's see, is this working? Well, it's great to be with you all. Thanks uh, to the gallery for having me. Back to New Haven. Uh, uh, what has not been mentioned is I've spent a lot of time in New Haven. I was a master's student at the forestry school once upon a time. And then I was a postdoc at the forestry school uh, a little while later uh, for four years. It was a long postdoc. Um, but it was a time when I actually thought a lot about many of the things I'll talk about in the second part of my remarks here. Um, I'm also excited to be here because I'm an old English major who's always looking for kind of a way back into the humanities. Um, and so any opportunity to kind of engage with, with the humanities and, and people thinking about art and, and literature and storytelling is really, is really fulfilling to me. So thank you. So I want to talk uh, about how to use the keyboard. <laughs> Uh, here um, about some issues that really are rooted in pretty ancient conflicts in the American West. Uh, I brought in this cover from the Yellowstone issue a few years ago, National Geographic magazine, which I helped, uh, which I worked on as a consulting scientist, um, and it made me so upset um, given the themes that I was working on, which had a lot to do with collaboration and working across large landscapes, that the subtitle when the issue came out was the Battle of the American West, or for the American West. But it's a good subtitle, because 
uh, the reality is that a lot for a long time has been a big battle in the West, whether it's over issues of land and water and weather and how they're used or protected, uh, whether we're talking about uh, some of the iconic wildlife populations, the creatures that we also think about, whether and how to protect or use, and of course, who gets to make these decisions, who gets to participate, who has what right to which of these resources and, and which tables uh, uh, of discussion. And so this is the context in which um, when I was a um, very naive young PhD student headed out to the University of Wyoming from FES, uh, I began working on wolves in Wyoming, where I had never been. I had never seen a wolf or an elk. These were the things I was going to study. And here I was showing up in northwest Wyoming to help figure out the wolf issue. Um, wolves were reintroduced in that region um, in Yellowstone National Park and nearby areas of Idaho in 1995 and 96, and have since uh, flourished. In spite of things you might read here and there, wolves are doing very well. There are lots of them now in six states in the West, including California. There's a few wolves now in the state I live in that aren't on this map on the bottom right. But the numbers have climbed steadily, and the distribution has grown uh, steadily geographically and very quickly. And everywhere wolves go, as many of you will know, they are the subject of intense conflict. Um, Kill a wolf, save 100 elk. Wolves are government-sponsored terrorists. Um, stop eating beef to save all the wolves. Um, when wolves howl, they issue biodiversity forth from their, from their bowels. Um, wolves belong, you know, and this goes on and on, and it, it goes on and on everywhere. Wolves arrive. Um, and so I kind of entered into this, this mix, um, uh, just north west of, of Cody, Wyoming. Um, and this is a wolf, uh, one of many that we captured in this project I worked on with um, federal and state agencies and others uh, for my graduate work, um, walking off after, after getting a collar put on him. And I was studying the interactions of wolves with elk, their primary prey, uh, in a context um, in which there's about heard of about 5,000 elk in that particular study area that had been declining pretty dramatically, at least a portion of it had. And um, all the sort of obvious um, correlations uh, in terms of when the decline started and when wolves show up pointed to an effect of wolves driving this decline. And, and so I, uh, I worked on that, those questions for a number of years. And I'm just going to tell you uh, and it's really painful to do this when you spend five years working on a dissertation, just to, to boil it down to a, you know, less than a minute of findings. But wolves didn't have as much to do with the decline of these elk as everybody, um, both for and against wolves, sort of thought they did um, in, the, in the beginning. What are the reasons why? Well, one of them is that elk are tougher than we think that they are, um, as are the prey of, of many large carnivores. Uh, this wolf that I actually showed you, recently released in this photograph, actually, uh, a year after this picture was taken, was killed by a bull elk. I found him dead with a big bloody hole in his armpit and in his groin, uh, surrounded by elk tracks and blood splatter. And so um, wolves are not as vulnerable and sensitive, or sorry, elk are not as vulnerable and sensitive to their predators as we sometimes think they are. These elk that I study also move over a huge landscape. Um, this particular herd and many others in the system is seasonally migratory. So in spring, they move. The, the, these are paths from GPS collars that I'm showing you here. And out on the right is Winter Range to the north and west of Cody. And then in the summer, they climb up several thousand feet in elevation and move 40, 50, 60 miles west up into Yellowstone National Park, which is the box on the left. Um, and so they go far away from where we actually observe their population numbers. Um, and where we sort of look at the factors generally that we think might be influencing their numbers, they go away into the wilderness and out of sight from 
much of our observation and monitoring, or I mean the, the agency's observation and monitoring, the, the agencies who generally you count them and keep track of them. And what happened when we went up there to see uh, what might ha be happening in the other half of these animals' lives was that another predator, the grizzly bear, was eating most of the elk that were going missing in really severe, um, intense drought uh, and hot summers over a period of years uh, between about 2005 and 10 had really reduced the sort of forage base that is uh, what allows these, these elk to reproduce uh, at, a, at a robust rate. And so they kind of were having this pinch from these other things that had nothing to do with wolves on the population. Wolves were playing a role, but not that much of a role. And we published papers, uh, which we tend to do as natural scientists. Um, but I also had started to get a sense that, you know, this wasn't all about science, and there were some public, you know, ideas about wolves. I had seen the bumper stickers and things, and I'd been frustrated by what I generally read in the newspapers, and so I started doing a little more to kind of engage with those depths of feeling and emotion around the wildlife I worked on. And for me, initially, that was kind of writing some op-eds and things like that. All of this work was incredibly painful, and I got really beat up really badly over a lot of it, whether it was during the peer review process, whether it was hate mail that results from publishing op-eds in national newspapers about things people are passionate about, whether it was um, agency leadership um, in a few cases who didn't agree with what we were finding. And, uh, and so it was kind of depressing and, and, and challenging for me uh, at the tail end of this work, kind of encountering um, things that I knew were there um, and reasons why I knew science had its limits, but much more viscerally and, and kind of brutally in my, in my uh, experience as kind of a young scientist. Um, and so I'm going to leave wolves for a minute, and I'm going to just tell you about um, kind of what happened next for me. This was actually when I was a postdoc at FES. I had become really interested in um, these migrations of elk, um, and I was curious where, where the other migrations were. There were historical reports um, and, and one-off studies in different populations around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which this map encompasses a lot of. And so I went around and worked with lots of agencies and other scientists to try and stitch together the available GPS movement information on elk and then um, and make new maps and build data sets to, to drive some, some new research. And this is what came together between this kind of collaborative process gathering existing information and going out and collaring herds that uh, were missing from the picture. And it's really kind of a, a pretty beautiful thing. Suddenly there are these veins and arteries kind of reaching out of the core areas of Yellowstone, radiating out into these uh, winter ranges where all of these populations that represent the movements of between 20 and 30,000 elk, that's like 10 million pounds of biomass moving in and out of the system seasonally. And that seemed so important to me. Um, that it shouldn't be left to the pages of scientific journals alone. Um, and, and here's one reason why. Um, I mean, you've just seen on that map, um, and hopefully gotten the sense this is a phenomenon that really matters to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is an important landscape. But here's the movement of one female elk across uh, a little swatch of the landscape. And you can see on the left her summer range in Yellowstone National Park. She crosses Forest Service in the middle here. She's out on private land and multiple use other public lands in the winter on the right. And so suddenly, after all these years of being engaged in a, a, a set of issues and stories that were totally divisive and that people used to divide each other over some of the issues I cared about in the West, it seemed to me that this was a story coming out of, of some of the research I was involved in that had maybe some power to talk to people about coming together. Um, 
this phenomenon is something that most people find beautiful, and you cannot look at it closely and map it without feeling there's some kind of dare to not get together and, and keep it going. And so I, I think uh, I could only sort of fully grasp that having been, <laughs> been through the, you know, the challenges of, of all the, the wolf work, um, that this region it seemed like this was a, an important topic for science, but it also was uh, a story that the region might actually benefit from in other ways. And so I um, worked uh, with a number of creative types um, to follow one particular migration that would help us to unpack the story of what these migrations are like. And we spent a few years out on the migration trails, if you can believe it. There's eight elk in the middle of this uh, image right here. And along with a photographer named Joe Reese um, and a videographer named Jenny Nichols and an artist named James Prosek, who some of you may know, I spent a lot of time back and forth on this trail. Joe worked his camera traps, which usually get torn down. Um, or, uh, or kicked and licked and, and beat up. Um, but, over a period, but over a period of several years, um, began to kind of bring out this rich story of these, these connections across the landscape and the animals making those connections. Um, we developed some of this into a film it's called Elk River. Before I play this video, I want to tell you um, it was very important to us, for me, for reasons I already shared with you, and also to others, um, to make this as sort of inclusive story as possible. So who do you meet on these migration trails? Who are the people that are involved and who are engaged and who uh, turn out sometimes to be people who felt left out of many of the other science and conservation stories and debates that have been going on? Wes and I would be the first ones over the mountain into the thoroughfare. It was a big adventure. I love to go see the elk, you know, in the spring, and then we follow it through the summer when we take our pack trips. We show people these beautiful herds of elk up on the high alpine meadows grazing. Then on into the fall, through the hunting season, we rely on the elk. And then in the wintertime, I go capture elk and net gun out of the Some of them are landowners, so I'll just show you a few I think it, it broadens an appreciation to know that, okay, this is a part of something a lot bigger than, than just our activities on the ranch. We're on the edge of the Yellowstone ecosystem, you know, we're really part of it. So yeah, it's just a wild, wild place, just living right, I mean, the wilderness area is just right above us, all around us. And so as we sent, we sort of stitched together the story involving these kinds of characters and some of the Native American history around these ungulates. We made a museum exhibit uh, that's still traveling. It incorporated some of James's work. Um, this is an image that he made that's really big and sort of impressive that's about a conversation that we had where he kept saying, why are these migrations so important? I still, you know, you need to beat it through my head. And I said, all right, James, I finally came up with this idea, this thought experiment. If you put up a fence around Yellowstone and every animal got trapped inside, here's what would happen to them and the ways the populations would collapse and everything would come down around them. And James made this picture. Uh, he also thought about how um, these, connect, these, these connections across the landscape made Yellowstone into a hybrid system of the human and the ecological system and made this painting uh, that the ranch owner, I was really excited to show uh, the painting to, had absolutely no comments about. <laughs> he just said, huh. But, but I, I love it. Um, worked with the National Geographic, uh, and others to distribute the maps. This was a fun thing to do to work on a, a, one of those posters I had on my wall as a, as a little kid. Um, and um, the difference that I felt from doing this work in which I got much more engaged in sort of the emotional dimensions of science and conservation in the West 
is that stuff has actually happened that is kind of um, exciting. And it's by no means um, even largely because of me. It's because of the work of a bunch of scientists who I think have been realizing the power of reaching across these sort of divides between science and uh, the arts uh, and, and communications um, and storytelling. Um, and that has manifested and begun to manifest um, as changes on the landscape where people are trying to change fencing or conserve land or, or build new partnerships to facilitate animal movements in that ecosystem and elsewhere. And so that's been a very satisfying aspect of doing this work. One of the most interesting things for me that I'm now deeply involved in is after running away from wolves uh, after my PhD work, for some of the reasons I told you, um, when we came back to the ranchers we worked with on the migration stuff and said, um, what would you like to have some research support on next? Most of them said, trying to reduce our conflicts with large carnivores. And so now much of our work is actually, I'm, I'm getting dragged back into the wolf story, but on a happier basis with a more kind of inclusive coalition of people who are pretty serious about trying to change um, things, maybe not immediately, but over time, try and find some, um, some, some uh, new ways of managing these conflicts. And so I have some sort of parting just points I want to make sure I offered that are, I probably left typos and all kinds of things here, but it's just to, just to offer that I, I, one of the things I'm sort of still um, struggling to kind of, to understand myself is, is in what ways scientists and conservations must engage in the emotional landscape and the sort of mythical landscape of the West. But I think they have to. I think we have to um, um, because I think as a scientist, um, I'm mean, not a scientist who thinks, um, who, who, who believes in capital O ob objectivity, uh, so to speak, uh, anymore. But, but I do think that as scientists, we um, are expected to have integrity and, and, and be true to, to the, uh, the data that we collect and uh, report it honestly. And, and so how do you maximize that integrity and sort of get as close to objectivity as you can? I think it's by knowing yourself uh, and positioning yourself relative to all this complexity and the system that you're working on. And um, maybe you can help me um, process that, but I think you can't, you can't get to where you wanna go as a scientist working in conflict in the West without really engaging um, in the sort of depths of these issues uh, for the culture. Um, and of course, I really believe uh, at this point that scientists and, and people who are really interested in conservation have to do better to engage the arts and storytellers. I don't know how to do it all the time, I actually think, and it's through the work of Jenny and others in previous discussions we've had, you know, begun to understand that we've done this better in some places and sometimes than we do now. And so maybe this is a question of how to restore some of those connections as much as it is about how to create them anew. And with that, I will tell you, this isn't a conventional research talk, but yet everything I do and present whether it's science or images or video, depends on somebody you know, contributing something. So I have to acknowledge lots of, of people who have supported different aspects of my work. So thanks. Okay. I'm gonna leave this ugly. I'm gonna find a prettier slide to leave. Oh, well look at that. <laughs> So I thought I would start this off by just right where you ended, Arthur, and asked Jenny. You said that you think we have done better integrating myth with science in the past, or belief with knowledge in the past. And I wondered if you might have comments about that. <laughs> oh, so many. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, the period that I work on, the 19th century, there's, there's 
those sort of disciplinary boundaries have not yet become enforced in the way that they have now. So to go back to some of our previous discussions that we were having before the panel started about the kind of um, the importance of, of interdisciplinarity and understanding um, different audiences and different the power of different media to commu communicate. And um, I think that's that's part of the story there. But the thinking um, thinking about also how these um, how myths become kind of naturalized, how we see, I mean, thinking about, um, uh, you know, for instance, the Albert Bierstadt painting upstairs and how these are landscapes so often constructed for, um, for barons of industry who are seeing them in a certain way and um, they are being uh, they're they're being understood, you know, in, um, to, to sort of communicate in in that regard, but also to the public about the sort of possibilities um, of, sort of resource extraction or tourism and the many different kind of audiences at play there. That I think sometimes when we say confront a landscape painting um, now, we might think, well, it's um, this is a, a beautiful spot. That we can, you know, uh, look out at this environment, but to sort of recover, I guess, some of that kind of complexity, and I think this maybe goes to one of the really essential points in thinking. Your discomfort with the the cover of the National Geographic magazine and the kind of um, the battle, um, because I think that's at the heart of what myth does in many ways is to propose a mode of storytelling that is also um, founded on kind of uh, battle or binaries, that there has to be a kind of predator and a prey, and that becomes maybe easier than to, to communicate the story. But then the story you're telling of is one of great kind of ecological complexity and sort of systems and how, how, do we, um, how do we think about, I guess, to your point too, the sort of possibilities for myth that might go beyond um, that, that kind of framework of um, binaries and battles and, and two, uh, two sort of points of view that also um, you know, leave aside so many sort of stakeholders and voices um, that are, are then not at all a part of the conversation. Mm. So those were some thoughts to your presentation arose. Yeah. Arthur, do you think you can confront myths with data and make a difference? <laughs> um, <laughs> Just, I mean, well, you have I, to, you must, because I, of the work that you do. I but, could. Uh, yeah. I guess, you know, the best way to start answering a question you don't know how to answer is to go to something concrete. And uh, I think of, you know, when I came out of, you know, kind of when I was reporting to the, to the state uh, about the things I worked on with Wolf Elk Interactions um, a number of years ago, um, you know, whether the things people held locally about wolves had the status of myth, I don't know, but they're certainly connected to deeper kind of myths that we've had for a, lo a long time about wolves. Um, and in that local and regional environment, uh, what I've learned since is that actually some of the things that we found, which I didn't think kind of mattered in any way to management, were a part of um, recommendations to reduce the levels of harvest of, of wolves in that um, part of Wyoming, some of the early quotas that were set um, in the first hunts. Um, and, uh, and so that was a case where the state really used the information to say, hey, look, you know, this creature isn't having this outsized effect that you think uh, here, and we've got, and it wasn't just, um, We've got science to help, you know, work through that problem. It was we have science actually from someone that you know and have been around a bunch. So that kind of gets into another dimension of all this. And there was, I think, um, some uh, trust that had been built up. But um, so that was a really small 
we, we didn't do anything with the deeper myths that wolves are afflicted by, but I guess I've, I've felt despair about that question from time to time, but I've also seen these small ways that we kind of chip, you know, chip away um, at uh, some of the local expressions of these, of these myths, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I'm struck by the comparison between your case study and uh, the will that so many of us have in science right now to make a difference in climate change. Um, and that making progress uh, is also very constrained by um, uh, values and what you, what you called so beautifully public ideas about something. And that um, in your case, pictures of animals evoke feelings and tap right into some of those value systems. And it seems like you can have an impact through these really lovely images of reality, the maps, the beautiful animals, the grizzly bear taken down, I mean, the video of these things really happening. And I think we're missing that in some of the things that we could do about climate change. I think, anyway, that's... Or it may be that there's some problems that are too complex to capture in, in those kinds of images and, and stories. Um, but I, I, I wonder. Jenny, are there examples like that on a big scale? Uh, I mean, I, I guess just uh, thinking about, you know, the, one of the first images that comes to mind that's used so often in terms of discussions of climate change and their visualization is the, you know, the polar bear kind of grip to the tiny, tiny fraction of an ice uh, iceberg and. Um, and I, I think there's a way and um, not enabling maybe images to speak to, and here we have a, a James's work, a kind of complexity or a hybridity or again, a kind of system, but um, that it is either images that um, illustrate kind of cataclysm and then assume maybe a certain kind of position already um, or ones that sort of normalize and, um, and I, I, I wonder if, again, rather than thinking that the problem is that the visual is not able to speak to such a complex set of operations or issues, that it's um, a reliance on illustrating one point or another or the kind of dire outliers that, again, to the, to the question of sort of audience, I think um, perhaps don't, um, don't speak to the kind of conversation at hand. I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to add a comment that, uh, in which I can inc include a bit of humility about you know, the, the things that we've done um, and colleagues have done. Um, just because we've stirred people's feelings and emotions in a positive way around ungulate migrations certainly does not mean that at this point there's you know, activity to conserve them at the scale at which that would be really impactful. And I, the reason I'm saying this, I think there's a corollary in the, the climate um, case where maybe it, it seems as if when you look at some of the polls and things, there, there, there is a movement in, in people's understanding that this is a, a grave problem. Um, but not so much in, but, but, but a lot of fractiousness and discord when it comes to how to solve this problem. And that's exactly what's happening around the, the issues I'm talking about here. So um, now uh, in, the, in the migration case, and it's the same kinds of players, um, in the migration case, uh, uh, industry groups in, in you know, Wyoming and other areas of the West have sort of finally gotten around to figuring out how to not have <laughs> corridors um, be designated um, to protect migrations in many areas. And I think that agencies I work with and others are sort of pushing ahead through that. And it, the jury's out on how all that's going to play out. But, but my point is, um, I think we've done a great job motivating people to care. I'm, I'm, the jury's out on 
what kind of consensus there will be around what kinds of, of solutions. And I wonder if there's a parallel there with the climate mm -hmm. problem. People care, but they don't really want to change, uh, give up some of the, the, the comforts and the money that they, <laughs> that they yeah, uh, get. But I, I mean, I think you're um, downplaying the effects of, of your project and this work too, though. I, I mean, I think sort of reframing, it starts by a certain kind of reframing of the conversation and seeing movement at the center of it, which clearly, you know, talking about migration would be, but that works against a certain, you know, framework of, you know, the wolf is out there and it's kind of the static portrait or the, you know, the elk over here, this, uh, this sense that, you know, uh, I think of the kind of image of the, the highway overpass as this, um, and the map around it and, you know, Jenny's film and, mm -hmm. and thinking about these animals in terms of movement and geography rather than um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a kind of static portrayal then begins again to sort of reframe the very conversation um, and the very assumptions perhaps um, that, that then might enable mm -hmm. um, change in terms of policy or, or small infrastructure changes that then you know, have significant mm -hmm. results in terms of migratory paths. But can I ask you a question, Indy? You, um, I, apparently. <laughs> so I, um, uh, I've, I've worked in, in the, the region out there for a number of years, um, not as long as you. Um, and by my sort of closeness to particular places and issues and kind of the tunnel vision I, I have with uh, at this stage in my life, um, I'm not sure, it's, it, it's become harder and harder for me to see the sort of the broader view on some issues in the West. And the question I want to ask you is, so I want to believe, the, the cover of National Geographic, to go back to that, I didn't like that subtitle because I don't want to believe that there's not a different future for these species and people and landscapes that I care about and one that's not about battle. constant battle. Yeah. And I, I essentially preach that. I, I, I give many talks and, and engage in many discussions in which I think I'm either you know, wishing or making the assumption or maybe cherry picking some of the information <laughs> about whether there is indeed kind of a groundswell towards more collaborative approaches. I, I think there might be. But 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 do I just want there to be? You 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 look pretty broadly across the region and have been in many areas of the region. And you were dean at the Haub School at University of Wyoming in the middle of all of these issues. Am I am I naive or am I? <laughs> is there a different future? Uh, I think it's on a case by case basis, um, and that until there's sort of a, um, an acknowledgement of the feelings and values behind the issues that we're studying, and then figuring out how to communicate about them, we won't get to common kinds of solutions and collaboration. And uh, I think we always have to bring the elephant out in the room and talk about it. I mean, in uh, resource extraction, when you know people make their money from coal, and that causes all kinds of problems, which are unfortunately global and not local. So the local economy flourishes, and the global climate suffers. Um, that's a really hard one to bring people together around. But when it's um, maybe wildlife habitat, where everybody in the West loves their wildlife, nobody really wants to screw up the environment, and everybody loves the wildlife, that you can find some common ground more quickly than others. Uh, air quality issues in the West um, were not something people really cared about until it turned out there were health impacts. Um, it's a little bit like thinking about the Montreal Protocol. That's my example. I mean, we, we passed this international Montreal Protocol to control CFCs in the atmosphere because it was really clear that it was hurting people. So I think, I think if you can evoke 
uh, a, a conversation about uh, not only the data, but people's values about them, and then bring it up. And, and I think there can be common ground in some cases, but not in every case. And, and I, um, I am glad that I left the West before the current administration, because I do think things are getting mm -hmm. harder to make a difference uh, with these things. Uh, but what I love is that anybody who wants to make a difference now really understands you have to understand what people's feelings are if you want to make a difference. You have to understand what the public idea is, what the myths are, where's people money, where people's money comes from, what their tradition in their family was, um, where the next mouthful is going to come from. And I think we're doing better as a science community in tapping into the humanities now to understand that that's the only way we can be effective. And how do we keep doing better at that? So this is, this is the question about um, Jenny and I are professors early in, well, I'm early in my career. Yeah, You're I'm sort of early in my career. <laughs> kind of keeping your head down, <laughs> trying tenure. to do your best on your projects and things. But you have to, you're managing a big academic program, a school mm -hmm. that has professional elements and um, research elements and outreach elements. And it's a school that prides itself on it, pursuit of interdisciplinarity. How do you, how do you stimulate, what's, what's a framework for kind of, um, accelerating interdisciplinary work, both in the sciences and, I guess, across the science humanities divide. Yeah. We do it on issues, but we don't have to do it with a big program. Yeah. I think it's providing um, career tracks that value making an impact and that measure impact in what we now call altmetrics. Um, so it's not just your numbers of papers you publish, but it's evidence that your work is making a difference. And then we find ways to talk about those together as a faculty, to value those, to say, wow, that's making us look good. And realize that, you know, uh, we get on the cover of the New York Times because of the work that um, Tony in the Yale Program in Climate Change Communications does that isn't necessarily about his science, it's about his ability to communicate externally and tap into people who want to know these things and confront them. So it's providing some reward systems. The other thing I think is that it's, it's about a culture that encourages interaction from the bottom up. You can't impose expectations uh, for people to be interdisciplinary. People have to be interested and passionate about being interdisciplinary. And um, that may be the biggest barrier that we have is that not very many people are really interested in being interdisciplinary. Yeah. You can say, I provide the framework, I provide the reward structures, you can do it. Um, but people might not do it because they don't care about doing that. So I think it's encouraging people in their undergraduate years to be interdisciplinary, and then finding ways to bring people together to establish projects. I'm under the impression that we should include comments from out there about myths and public ideas and uh, human values and how it relates to science. Are there questions out there? Go ahead. I can take the first uh, question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a very strong one, and um, the Lamar Center, uh, certainly, and um, George Miles' development of the Western Americana collections at the Beinecke, um, Johnny Farragher, who recently retired. Um, and that program, um, there hasn't been a faculty replacement yet for Johnny's position, and I know that um, the, the student community has kind of built from the bottom up <laughs> a listserv and, and trying to 
um, think through what the study of Western history looks like now. I and mean, I know from my end, I just taught a course on representing the American West that was almost wholly from the Beinecke's collections and thinking about, you know, how can we support new scholarship that works with these um, extraordinary collections here at Yale and asks a range of questions depending on where these students are their home uh, disciplines are and kind of bring together to Indy's point, you know, um, early on in, in one's, you know, academic trajectory, uh, kinds of, you know, this kind of conversation and thinking about um, the history of the American West in, in all forms. Um, but certainly I think the use of collections and, you know, material histories is really essential um, and is such a strength of this university and, and can be such a great point of interdisciplinarity when you're sort of around an object or an image or a collection to provoke different different discussions. So. Do you think worlds are more accepted in the West now? Well, I would take that. It depends on the scale of, you know, the temporal scale, right? So wolves have become more accepted over a century and and more in the in the wet in the West, like the Western nations um, and beyond because cultures have decided we we ought not to be doing what we're doing to to eradicate you know animals wholesale anymore and we've enshrined those new ethics and values from ecology in law and things like the Endangered Species Act and other kinds of laws. Um, you know, an interesting piece of history uh, in the Yellowstone ecosystem is the moment when the Park Service had um, the Leopold Report of 1963 or four that said, you know, how do we do management across this idiosyncratic bunch of, you know, dozens of units now where we have all these problems bubbling up and the um, outcome there was uh, have natural regulation with less intervention from managers. Um, and that has really led to a lot of ideas about reintroducing species, uh, trying to reduce invasive species, letting fire play out uh, as it used to in many landscapes. So we've got policy developments like that that have in, continued to enshrine some of the values that have let them recover. But we get you know down to, to the finer and more recent scale. and. Um, I think people actually, in spite of what it looks like and sounds like sometimes, um, there is, time goes by, you know, and so even in a place like Wyoming, people kind of work out, you know, some of their frustration over time and new generations come along, that's at play. And the last thing I'll say, which is a little bit, uh, uh, I guess, provocative, um, is that people are allowed to kill them sometimes. Um, and when that's not possible under certain kinds of protection, it seems like you get, uh, and I have a number of colleagues that would totally object to me saying this um, and who've tested this idea with social science data, so it's an open debate. But I am of the view from my experience that when people are allowed to engage in harvesting some of these animals uh, or uh, removing them, killing them when they're really are in conflict with their property or their livestock, that that tends to let off some additional kind of steam um, and, and restore a sense of at least some self kind of determination around the issue. So I would argue all those things at multiple scales have been playing into, um, into it. And then we have states and places in the country where people love wolves. So when they arrive in California, well, not everybody in California does, but there are states that are more uh, open to, to these species. Very much for very stimulating visual and uh, oral remarks. Uh, uh, Jennifer and Arthur wanted to explore some of the religion and ecology dynamics. We have a joint degree program at the Forestry and Environmental School between the uh, Yale Divinity School and the School of uh, the Environment. And uh, so the question I wanted to ask both of you was with regard to 
religious traditions and some of the deep mythic values. I'm thinking of Mormonism and the journey, Christianity and the garden, mm -hmm. uh, myth images that are playing themselves out also. And in terms of animals, the relationship and the animals in these religious traditions, it's not widely held forth, but they are churning in these traditions. And I wanted to ask if you see it playing it out in your work in any way. I'll let you start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, I, it, given what brings us together, I mean, maybe it's worth thinking through this in terms of um, Matthew Barney's film and, and the um, installation upstairs as well and the way that um, various cosmologies kind of come together in, in, in the film and through various mythic discourses too, whether it's, you know, ancient mythology, Diana and Acteon, um, or sort of new <laughs> mythologies, as it were, and um, uh, the, the, you know, the figure of the Electra Plater as herself, a kind of um, modern day mythic kind of alchemist <laughs> creating these um, kind of uh, cosmographic constructions. So I think sort of everywhere is this imbrication of, of myth and environment and ecology and um, um, spirituality and how that sort of plays out in the film too in terms of a kind of language of dance um, and transmission as a sort of mode of communication. So in just thinking of um, the example again that kind of brings us together here tonight, um, the installation in the film, I think that's that's certainly at play, not in any kind of maybe specific religious traditions, but the ways in which these sort of origin myths and figures such as the wolf um, and thinking of, um, you know, at one point the electroplater is, you know, creating a kind of um, constellation that has to do with lupus and, and thinking about the relationship with, with the sky and the landscape. And um, that sort of brings, brings the film together as well. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an element that's um, sort of everywhere at play and one of those, uh, an element that perhaps is, is not in the kind of academic context that often we operate in and, and notwithstanding your own certainly, one of the really in, enormously important parts of, of the program is to sort of put this forward as an essential and connective part of the conversation when questions of um, religion are, are not addressed or not understood in terms of, again, kind of, um, and their relationships with myth were losing a huge part of the, um, of, of the conversation and the dialogue, I would say. I don't know that I have a good, I, do, I mean, I, what I'm struck by is just how spirituality and um, is just, and, and, and the Christian faith is, is just not a part of the conversation about these issues, and I, I and that I don't, it just doesn't, I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't ways in which, you know, under the surface, I, there are unrecognizable ways that, that, that I and, and the things I work on am not affected by, by the spirituality and beliefs of others, but, but I'm struck given what, what you both obviously recognize about the importance of those connections and the relevance of those ideas and beliefs at how little this is something that is talked about. Um, and I guess I blame both of the communities involved, both the, uh, my, you know, both that of science and, and kind of the conservation and uh, that of the community of faith that it seems like um, ought to be more engaged on questions around the natural world and what we're going to do with it. Um, so that, I, I, my only response is I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it seems like a, a problem that I don't have a better <laughs> response. Take one, just take one more, and then we should be quiet and do informal, especially since my mic doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Your very thoughtful and thought-provoking words. Um, I was struck by the National Geographic devoted to Yellowstone. 
yes, by the subtitle, but also just by the design and typography that was chosen for that cover. And I remember when that came out. Hmm. And the fact that it could be like the opening credits of a 50s Western or the you know TV series Bonanza. And here we are in 2016. And mm -hmm. National Geographic, you know, devotes a whole issue um, to Yellowstone and, you know, serious scientific and historic research and then puts on the cover that kind of myth yeah. per perpetuating image or almost design. As if, it's almost as if you were in the room when some discussions oh, yeah, were like, being yeah. had about that. Yeah, um, well, I guess that's a comment more than a question, but that was very much discussed. I, I did not, nor have I ever worked for the organization. I was sort of a consulting scientist and subject of some of the um, work and took the writer in the backcountry and helped connect with, with people. My biggest concern in that whole issue, other than kind of getting the story of the ecosystem in there and getting some of the people in there that weren't like an NGO person in you know, Jackson or, or Bozeman, Montana, um, um, was um, kind of, uh, I mean, but th th that was really the big concern for me. And, and, uh, and so that, it was an amazing, um, David Quammen did an amazing job, and it did address those issues, the ecology and the conflicts very deeply, but then it sort of didn't represent that very well. But it provoked people, mm -hmm. which is Right. Yeah. 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 Let's thank Arthur again. Mm -hmm. And then one you. <laughs>